take this opportunity to thank the uh, teaching committee uh, chair people that are on the committee, as well as the SCPGA section staff, especially Tom Addis, Nikki Gatch, Jeff Johnson. Uh, I'd like to also welcome our guests from the PGA UK, PGA Canada, and the LPGA. Welcome to Southern California. We'd also like to take this opportunity to, stay, to thank our partners and friends at Travis Matthew have made this all happen. So thank you very much, Travis. I think we have a little, a little message from Ryan Ellis. Hi everyone, I uh, hope everyone's safe and well out there. Crazy times, obviously. I know you guys are doing a lot of adapting. I actually appreciate the creativity in, in, in doing this SCPJ event virtually. Um, certainly we've all got to adapt to the times, whether that's moving half of your, you know, your restaurants and your clubhouses outside um, or the safety protocols you guys all have to go through. So I appreciate, I know you guys are probably working harder than ever. Um, and I appreciate you guys doing this virtually. I think it's really important in these times we get creative. Here at Travis Matthew, we, we've got about 15% of our people back in the building, so it's pretty eerie. Um, I've been in the building most of the time, and there's certainly days where nobody's here, and we've got, you know, we were able to fit about 350 people in here, and it's a ghost town. So at, at times depressing, but also at times, you know, the solitude is nice, gives you a lot of time with your thoughts. Um, my name is Ryan Ellis. Uh, I'm the CEO of Travis Matthew. For those of you who don't know me, um, some of you know this. I stepped in as CEO back in August uh, for Travis Brasher. Um, we've been planning on this for quite some time. I was formerly president of the company. My role hasn't changed a ton other than sort of being the final decision maker now, which has been very exciting and invigorating. Uh, those of you that know me, I'm not getting a ton of sleep uh, due to my excitement level. Um, but I, I wanted to start by saying... You know, Travis is a PGA professional. I certainly am not. Uh, you can ask Eric Lohman. He can attest. He's seen my golf swing. It's not good. Uh, but I have been in, in, in PGA situations, and I've been in golf for 13 years. I was the first employee hired at the company. Most of you know me because I pioneered the line 13 years ago. And again, I appreciate all your guys' support um, throughout the years. And certainly, I really care about the, the SCPGA so much and it's so so dear to me because of all the support you guys have given us travis matthew would not be what it is today and i certainly love the pga i love the golf industry and we're in an amazing time popping out of covid it's busier than ever golf's at an all-time high um, and so i want to make sure that you guys know not being a pga professional i'm very very passionate about investing in golf, whether that's our PGA players, whether that's the SCPGA or the PGA all throughout the United States. So while we've become more lifestyle as a brand, we're rooted in golf, we're super proud of that. And I think we're gonna show that more than ever. So any way we can partner with you guys, we wanna do that. Some of the things we're doing that are different than what we've done in the past as the brand's gotten more lifestyle is we've, we've introduced Quater, which is our golf footwear line, which has had a ton of success. We had some really cool ideas on what we could bring to golf footwear, and we think we've matched comfort, performance, and style kind of all in one, so we're excited about that. We're bringing in the Heater Series, which is specifically catered to golf, and our PGA Tour players, which is true warm weather product that performs really, really well and has more poly than cotton, but still has that kind of on and off the course feel, but it's a little more performance based, and we have a short and a pant to kind of match that too. So really investing back in golf is really important to us. So I hope you guys have a great event. I do want to thank personally Jamie Mulligan. He's been a great mentor of mine. He's helped grow the brand from day one to today. I've been fortunate enough to sit down and pick his brain and think about things that we're going to do. And my brain's just spinning. And we've got a lot of cool ideas. So thank you guys for all the support. We hope you have a great event. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Travis Matthew. Well, let's get ourselves going. Grab your, grab your coffee. Grab, grab your your coffee and your banana and sit back and let's enjoy this this great show we're going to have we're going to start with uh, uh, a friend colleague a mentor uh, jamie mulligan uh is a pga scpga hall of fame member the ceo of virginia country club golf magazine top 100 teacher golf digest 50 best two-time scpga teacher of the year two-time SCPJ Professional Development Award winner. He's in the Long Beach Hall of Fame 
Jamie's students include World Hall, World Golf Hall of Famer Amy Alcott, John Cook, World Number 14 Patrick Cantley, Women's British Open Champion Mo Martin, and Luke List. So Jamie, take it away. I know you got a great line of speakers that uh, you will introduce, and let's have a great show. Thanks, Randy, very much, and thanks for putting this all together and a great job that you do as the chair and everybody that joined us this morning. The concept of when we started to do this four years ago is how can we all get better at teaching the game that we're all in love with in order to make people enjoy the game more, in order to make our skills better, and we've had a great four years. Randy, thanks for being the glue to hold this together. It's a pleasure to work with the SDPGA, and I'm really excited to have uh, my three buddies on here to talk to you about the game. One of the things that I was going to tell you is a lot of time when we're on the road, we're out just walking along at a golf tournament and one of our players might be playing with somebody else or we might be on the range and we all stop every day and special you with these three gentlemen and we pick their brains. So first we have Justin Parsons. Justin is, uh, was born in Ireland. He uh, started his career or really honed his career in Dubai with the Harmons and uh, then he's now down in Sea Island. He has an unbelievable uh, teaching style, and what I really like about his players is they all look different, but they're all very, very good. He's working with uh, Gary Woodland and Brian Harmon and Harris English, to name a few, and um, it's nice on a daily basis to always kind of run something by him and see his take, and, and I'm really glad to have you aboard. Justin, thanks for joining us. And then next, we have our 2019 National Teacher of the Year, Kevin Kirk, and uh, Kevin, as well, has been an, an amazing teacher. You know, he has a very interesting background, grew up in Venezuela. He's taught golf all over the world, and he has an amazing client base. He is our national award winner uh, last year, and a very bright guy. Uh, his teaching clients in, include Jonathan Vegas and Graham McDowell, the U.S. Open champion and Masters champion, uh, Patrick Reed, as well as Lexi Thompson, to name a few. Kevin, it's really nice to have you aboard. And then I'll introduce Mark while we work on that. And then lastly, our 2020 National Teacher of the Year, Mark Blackburn. Uh, Mark's been my partner in crime out there on tour for a while and a guy that we get to pick his brain as well too. And his honors are, 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 are deep and long. And um, he's presently teaching Charlie Hoffman, Chad Zrivi, Kevin Chappell, and I think many of you saw the Champions Tour event. He's working with Mike Weir, former Masters champion, who's reviving his Champions Tour career as well, too. How are you doing? Good, buddy. Good to have you aboard. Kev, we're going to work We're gonna uh, work on getting you on the audio-wise, and Mark and JP will start with you, okay? Perfect. Everybody that's on the call today, you know, they're teaching everybody from the beginning golfer to the intermediate player, and sometimes everybody's getting to work in the tour players who are on the call, and we get asked this question a lot, you know, are you teaching the tour player like the regular player, or are you teaching the regular player, and then you became a tour player coach, and how did that evolve? So, Mark, I'd like to start with you. I know you get that question a lot, and, and uh, kind of give me some feedback on what you do with the average person and, and how did that evolve into you becoming a tour player and are you still using fundamentals in the system that you use with everybody whether it's beginning intermediate or pro yeah i, I kind of look at every golfer is essentially trying to produce a shot with their desired shot pattern whatever that may be whether it's a draw whether it's a fade whether it's high whether it's low and then and from that, essentially, based on the ingredients they bring to me, I'm trying to create a recipe for that. And I kind of use the same framework, whether you're a beginner or whether you're a, a tour player, essentially, okay, you're set up. What is that compromise? What are the pieces in there? Do you have the right ball position, alignment, posture, tilts, grip, and such to kind of influence the shot that you want to hit? And then how do you move the club in the backswing? Like, how do you pivot? What's the shape of the swing? Kind of how does that look? And then in the downswing, how do you deliver the club into the ball? Does it support the shot pattern that you want to have? And relative to the player's skill, the framework's still the same. I'm still trying to produce essentially the shot that they want and the outcome or influence that to the best of their possibility. Obviously, the only difference between the club golfer and a tour player is the tour player can actually do what you want them to do most of the time. So you have to be pretty accurate on the information. But the, the framework is the same. And I think what helps us when we're on tour, whether it's JP, Kevin or yourself, is look, when players are struggling, 
The hours that we've spent in the trenches teaching bad players, having to fix a ball flight quickly and get results. A lot of times we use those same skills and that same toolkit when you're on the range at Augusta or whether you're at the Players Championship in some shape or form. You're still trying to be the puppeteer and pull the strings and then I'll give them something they can go play golf with. So I think that, you know, I've, with experience comes wisdom. And a lot of that's based on the fact that, look, I've done a lot ex if experience wise, I know how to get a given outcome. And that's, the, I don't see a whole lot of difference other than the skill set, sometimes the personalities between tour players and the average golfer. And so Mark, that's a really good answer. And JP, before we get to you, there's a couple of things that hit there. I love the nomenclature, nomenclature framework. I think that's really important. Like we've got to build and you got to stay within your framework. And I know that you do a great job of that. And then I love what you said, the puppeteer, like, I think that people might not realize it, but Every tour player isn't ready to go play a perfect round. And sometimes you're using some tricks in their warm-up. Sometimes in the warm-ups, you just say, hey, that was a really fun Dodger game to watch last night, which it was. Sorry about that, JP, for you Georgia guys. But uh, it, it, any, anyhow, but a lot of times you're doing some tricks and you're getting them ready to go, Mark. So that's interesting to hear your take on that. JP, same question. You know, I think that every player has a goal i mean every player whether it's a pga tour player or a recreational player i try and delve into you know what is going to make them get the most out of their experience with me i mean how do they you know how do they rate their current level of performance where would they like to land whether that's after a you know a, a day-long session with me or whether it's a, a program that's a little bit you know further afield than that and i think if we can if we can get to where we're looking at that performance again whether a tour player or a recreational player and help to satisfy the needs of the client you know that's kind of where i go with it so you know that allows me to to plan and, and put things in place that are going to work towards making that person a better golfer and making them enjoy their experience good 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 answer those answers are helpful uh, next thing kind of uh dovetailing right after what we talked about um i I think we're still working on Kevin getting him on the line, but you know, a major is the Dom Perion of our game, right? If you win a major championship, it's kind of the best thing that we do. And I know you try not to act like this, but it feels more important at a major. It feels more important at a players championship. It feels more important at a world golf championship. There's just a little bit more. The field's a little bit better. The courses are a little bit better and everybody's working so hard. You've both got to work with players that have uh, won major championships. And obviously, you know, in what we do, you're all going back and picking their brain and going, hey, what happened that week? And what did it feel like? Because that's when you big the, you won the best tournament. As uh, you might say, that's when you wrote your best album. So you're kind of picking their brain and saying, how did you come up with, with, with lyrics and music for that? JP, why don't you start with, like, Gary with the U.S. Open since it's pretty fresh? Yeah, I think, you know, it's always interesting. I think ultimately most of them have a feeling of, of peace and that they prepared well and that things have, have made them feel comfortable with the outcome. I remember talking to Darren Clark about winning at Royal St. George's and you know Darren was a complete mess Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and he didn't really know you know what sort of performance he was going to get certainly on the putting green and he managed to corner Dr. Bob Rotella I think quite late on the Wednesday and those that were staying in the house with him said this wonderful um, version of Darren Clark woke up on the Thursday morning who was you know, saying hello to everyone, and people said, hi, how are you doing, Darren? He says, I feel fantastic today, and he just went on and, you know, put in a performance of a, of a lifetime. You know, I think we'd all be uh, remiss to think that we know what the um, the equation is to achieve peak performance and to achieve these things, like Jason Kokrak winning for the first time yesterday at Shadow Creek. You know, he's a golf course. He's played quite a lot. You know, Drew Streckel, his coach is there in Vegas, so, and we know he's got a, an association with the MGM brand and things. So, you know, I think quite oftentimes there is something there that puts players at ease and makes them comfortable. And certainly from Gary's perspective, I know we did some work with with Birch and Pete Cowan somewhere around about the the, uh, the locality of Pebble Beach. I know he was pretty comfortable and confident with every aspect of his game going in. So I think if we can achieve that level of comfort that they know they're ready to put in a performance, then you know we can we can let them go from there. That's a really good answer. And I know from getting to do this, like you never know when it's going to be your week and super intriguing like well, what you spoke about with like Darren Clark like after his career it reminds me of Marco Mira they have these long kind of storied career but never win the big one and also they get in their 40s and they do uh that's neat that you've had that association 
I want to talk about that more when we're on the uh, on the road, just to kind of pick I'll your brain. Tell you, I'll tell you all the things that Darren and I shared together, but I'll I'll tell you all the golf stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you need Advil if you did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then. Uh, Mark, why don't you go into Mike Weir as your master's champion and then talk a little bit just about Mike and the evolution of kind of Mike and what he's doing now and how motivated he is. And I got to spend a lot of time with him early in his tour career. He was a good buddy of a guy that I was teaching and uh, I've always been real fond of him and I know that he's playing better and you've had a lot of fun working with him. Yeah, so Mike, it's pretty interesting. Obviously, you coach someone who's won a major, you want to know all about what were the sort of underlying, if you like, influences for that week and why you played so well so that you can share that with your other players, right? The younger players that you coach. And I think that one of the things JP alluded to is like a calmness. So Mike said, um, you know, that week he was very much into his routine and knowing that he basically had around 11 seconds to hit from when he walked into the ball to hit the ball. That was kind of something he was working on with his psychologist at the time. But um, Mike's obviously a super competitive guy. He's kind of got that sort of ice hockey mentality, Canadian guy. And he's big on, um, like, he said that he felt like he was the best player there. He knew he knows that how good Tiger was at the time. But, like, he said, like, it doesn't matter to me. I was playing a really good stretch of golf. And that essentially, I felt if I did what I needed to do well, I was going to play well and I would, you know, be in the movie, so to speak. And I, I think that says a lot. Now, that golf course has changed a little bit since then. So obviously, there's slightly different. But back then, I think that there was a lot. Well, how's a diplomatic way to say this? I think there was a lot more um, variability in who was going to win back then and there is now because obviously there wasn't such a bias right on distance and some other things and i think mike's game is really good with wedges obviously putting and he was able to kind of grind it out there and obviously then he wins in a playoff but he's definitely a calmness a confidence he was very much about routine and and kind of that was his focus and i think that's the learning there is that again you don't seem to think uh, here of players talking about the weeks that they win majors, that there was some major technical epiphany that they had. It's a lot more that they, they've done the work previous to the week getting there. You know, JP talked about Gary seeing Butch and Pete, but, you know, when they were there, they'd done the work. They knew that they were in a good spot. It was staying out of their own way, so to speak. And I really think that that's what the best players do um, I know that when Tiger was in his heyday and you were, I was at tournaments coaching in the early 2000s, he was the person that was at the golf course the least. He'd already done it. He was saving his energy for the back nine on Sunday. And I think that there's a lot to be said to that. Cramming for the test at the end rarely yields good results. Do you know what I mean? So I think from Mike, it's a lot more of, you know, being present, knowing that you've done the prep work so that you're able to, in basically navigate any scenario and situation that you face and you embrace that and you really you know, like the challenge of trying to score and, and navigate a golf course and i think that's what the best players do they're always feel like they're prepared it's a challenge hit it go find it how do i get it around the golf course and then add them up at the end which is such an old aid old adage we say but that seems to be a big commonality amongst major champions yeah, so um, that's fine. Mark, you said three things there that kind of jumped off the page that I want you to expound on. I know that Mike has done a bunch of work with uh, Dr. Rich Gordon, and I know a bunch of, you know, they were working hard at that time. Will you talk about the 11 second routine? Because, you know, we've had to do this with all of our players, and some of them have a little longer routines, and some of them have two quicker routines, to be pretty honest. The ones that have two quick, quicker routines, it's like you never get them slowed down. And the ones that go really slow, it's like you never get them sped up. But they do have a sweet spot that they play from. And the routine is basically what they need to do to hit a shot. I'll call it the Kobe thing, you know, bounce, 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 look up at the basket, take a deep breath, and fire. Our game probably looks a little bit more complicated than he definitely made free throw shooting look, which if for all of you out there, if you haven't Googled Kobe shooting a free throw, that will definitely make you a better golf instructor, especially when you're working on routine. But Mark, please, uh, please talk about the Rich's relationship in the 11 seconds a little bit because I, I know you know the in-depth of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's more of like how 
if you have a long amount of time, right? Like think of a pre-flight pre-flight checklist. Oh, once yeah. you go through once you go through the routine, essentially you're able to sort of block out any interference and there's not enough time to overthink the situation or or any doubt and your nervous system is going to respond and i think to mike's point his goal was about 11 seconds was the frame framework and the sweet spot for his mind not to wander now doc gordon may have had some other sort of reasonings for the time frame but that's about it it was essentially okay let me go through this go through my routine pull it up and not overthink and i think by nature lots of players have different personalities some players aren't particularly technical and they just flow with their routine and it just looks so easy and then the guys that tend to internalize and are pretty technical routine can be difficult because it's almost like they don't feel like they're ever ready now for someone like mike who's a perfectionist very detail orientated the 11 seconds is almost giving you like you have to do it in this time frame so that you can't overthink it and you can't overanalyze. It's more of a, OK, what's the distance? What's the yardage? What's the shot I'm hitting? OK, deep breath. Look at the target. Go. Done. And then I'm on to the next shot. Whereas I think you see a lot of people I do, especially with club golfers, they're like it's agonizingly slow and you're like hold on guys like this is a musician like you're trying to it's like you're playing an instrument you got to have a bit of a flow to it how do you create that and i think that's where the 11 seconds came from is for him that kind of was the sweet spot that worked really well now some people it might be longer some people it might be shorter so to me it's more of a it gives you a stopping point and a framework and regardless of the situation you know that 11 seconds and that is really important when you come under the cosh because it's your safety blanket like it's just okay i'm ready to go like you, you don't even think about it and if you look at good players their timing and their routine tends to have very little variability when they're in high stress situations because it's what's their insurance policy to perform well yeah, well stated. I like it a lot. JP, I'm going to give you a part of what Mark said because I want to get your take on what he said. But I think he said something key, and you and I kind of wink at each other a lot when we're walking back and forth on the range uh, when we're not trying to laugh at either one of us. But um, he talked about how everybody thinks how technical it is, like we're flying in there and fixing the left wrist position or the right arm, and that's really what's going on, and you're working on that. But so much of that is done and they know that they have that and they know they have their swings and he alluded to that kind of in what he was talking about i know you have a bunch of on, on that will you will you speak about that is it a technical game or is it a rhythmical game and are they just going at the highest level what are they doing from your standpoint you know, i think that's where something mark talked about earlier you know the experiences you have in the trenches the experiences you have not only with really good players but even with average players you know, young coaches come to me sometimes and, you know, they see the Instagram stuff and they say, well, how, how do I get better? What seminar should I go to? And I said, well, you should probably try giving, you know, give 60 golf lessons a week for, you know, for three or four years and, you know, see how good a teacher you become. And I think those, you know, those experiences both rooted in teaching and in playing will help us to recognize when we need to go down a technical route and when we need to go down, you know, let's, let's call it a more holistic route. And I think that, a lot of times, you know, as, as, as we all know, when, when you introduce something technical, you're you're really going to damage an awful lot of other parts of the mechanism. And I think that... Keep going on that, but I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but keep going on that. I think there's a bunch there. Well, as soon as as soon as soon a player begins to, to, to think about how he's doing something as opposed to what he's doing or what she's doing, the mechanism will slow down and become much more, I would say, rusty, if you like. So if that player is not thinking about the shot and they're not thinking about their um, their capacity to hit the shot, what the golf shot looks like, maybe what it sounds like in some cases, you know, anytime anytime they move away from that kind of the reality of golf, then I think it becomes an awful lot more difficult for them to achieve peak performance. And also it gets frustrating for them because all of a sudden they're they're having to think about something that should be fairly natural to them. So in my case, my own personal preference is to steer them away from those things if I can. And certainly during tournament weeks, if if they can be thinking of very, very little when it comes to the golf swing, or I can be, you know, refreshing a field from, you know, from months ago, then I think I can be doing a good job because, you know, experience both playing and teaching has taught me that if I throw in those technical fields to a, 
you know, a, an excellent player who's already in command of his or her faculties, then all of a sudden, I, again, I'm disrupting that mechanism. So, you know, the, it, it surprises me how many will go away from things like pre-shot routines and will go away from their natural rhythms and natural flows. And when put back into them, um, because they're, you know, if, if I'm standing working with a player on the PGA Tour, they're a good player anyway. Um, you know, my main job is not to mess them up and to get them, you know, back to doing things that they probably have been able to do in the past. So, you know, routines and visualization techniques and rhythm and flow and tempo are definitely ways to do that. But of course, if the technical mechanism is broken, then we need to have the tools to be able to put that back, you know, at an appropriate time. Yeah, great answer. And I, I think everybody out there, they're getting some great words for their toolbox. I love mechanism. I think that's a great way to look at it. It's fun to watch a player locked in right now. Like you did an amazing job with Harry English. I know his background really well. He's had other teachers. He's kind of gone on. He looks like he's in the right place right now. I know that, you know, in the last couple, three months, we've got to warm up next to each other at events. And, um, you know, we have a guy that can get in that spot too. And you're not saying a lot in the warm up. you know, we're just kind of standing there and talking and watching him go. And the club looks like it's on beautiful plane and it looks li really linear and it looks really clean. It looks like he does the same drill, the same warm up. His warm up lasts exactly the same amount of time. His attitude looks exactly the same. He has the same kind of chill way about him, whether you see him on the course or you see him walking off the course. It's a beautiful thing that's going on and you've done fantastic work with him. With I know there's a lot more good stuff to come. Let's talk about his evolution a little bit and kind of what you've done there. And I know he's in that bubble, so don't get him out of it. But speak about that a little bit if you can, please. Well, I, think, I think one thing that happened this week is kind of, you know, it, it's a, a part of the, 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 the right where we are, but it also kind of illustrates where Harris is being. You know, he, but out this week, you know, I felt a little bit of stress, a bit of anxiety, a bit of tension, you know, tried to obviously diffuse that shot 75 on Thursday and, you know, made the point of meeting him afterwards, which after tour players shoot 75, it's not always the greatest place to, to, to be as their coach. And I just said, look, you know, you've played so well for the last 18 months that if there's going to be a lull and this is going to be a lull, what are we going to do? Are we going to throw away the playbook that's been successful and try and go to the range right now and search for things? Or are we just going to continue to do what we've been doing under the premise that that's been successful and you've been successful and it's okay not to perform well every single day? And he went, yeah, I, I just need to go home and rest and come back tomorrow. And I think, I think two years ago, I don't think Harris would have said that. I think he would have probably said, let's go to the range. Let's try something new. Let's try and figure out what I've been doing. And I think, you know, the backstory really lies there that whenever we first started, I asked him about his alignment. He was very, very inconsistent with his alignment. As soon as he started to think more about alignment and where he'd like to just start the golf ball, you know, he started moving on it a little bit better. And then we kind of said, you know, he's got a, I, we, I know we're, we're all teachers here talking. So, you know, Harris has got an interesting move. He doesn't have a lot of set in his wrists. He's got a very, very torquey downswing. So the club gets spat out quite hard. And, from reviewing some things and you know understanding the way that might work, you know it, it, when he gets a lot of pitch in the golf club, is even though his hands can work out in front, the golf club's still got enough life in it and he can hit that nice little cut. So we made it a real premise to have the club working through. I would say more in front of his hands than a lot of other players that I would want to you know work with. Louis, for example, very classic kind of swing gets the club right in line with his hands and the takeaway. Harris's club will be you know, maybe six to eight inches in front of his hands as it works through kind of parallel to the floor. So you've seen some of the exercises we do just with alignment rods, pretty simple little things to help him cue in on that. You know, okay. and when he when he feels consistency within that part of his golf swing and within his alignment, you know, then he gets into that nice kind of repetitive mold. And I know you've got Dr. McCray, Dr. Brett McCabe coming in this weekend. Uh, Brett and I have worked with some players and, and he had, did a little bit of work with Harris. And one of the things that he did was a, he did like a, a, a specific kind of learning detail. He did trying to figure out how players learn. One of the things with Harris is he's extremely rhythmic. So he can identify rhythms and patterns very well. So, you know, having learned about how he worked, being able to get him into that kind of almost like ritualistic structured movements that's where he really finds a lot of calm. So, you know, he chews gum an awful lot on the course and you've seen his rhythm. It's very, very, you know, it's very calm when he's out there. So, you know, everything kind of leading up to getting him back to, to who he is. Good, great. That's good to hear. Hey, Kevin, can you hear me? 
Kevin, can you hear me? Kirky's still having uh, technical difficulties. Hello, can you hear me? Kevin, is that you? That's me. Oh my goodness, this is great. Kevin, uh, um, uh, it's nice to talk uh, to somebody other than these two guys with the accents. I haven't even understood any of their <laughs> answers yet, so it's nice to have you on the phone. <laughs> That's uh, some pretty com pretty bright and compelling stuff so far. It's been great to listen to, that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. Kevin, it's nice to have you aboard. Uh, well, let's go right that's into fine. you, okay? Um, practice sessions at home as opposed to an event, and I know that you, you do a lot of practice with your guys at home, and I know especially with Patrick Reed, and you know you got a guy there that's playing golf 392 days a year, and um, – He's working on his game all the time, and you'll have times when, you know, because you live in the same city, you'll have times where you'll go down and you'll see each other, and you'll, you'll see each other, and you'll, uh, and you'll work just time after time. Will you talk a little about what you're doing at, in practice when you're not having a bet? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you've always got patterns and systems that you're trying to manage, and so uh, you have the movement patterns, you know, the skills are full swing and putting, chipping, pitching, and bunker things that you have to stay on top of. And then you also have the performance training, which is, is quite different. It, uh, it's actually more task-based. And um, um, so um, let me see. I've got to try to mute something here. I've got too much going on, I think. Um, well, the fact that you're here, we're, we're proud of you. And then Mark just popped on the screen, too. Mark okay, wearing, cool. Mark wearing a very chic hoodie. Hoodies are chic in golf now. I never thought I'd see the day. <laughs> Kev, how you doing? Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Okay. Cool. All yeah. right. So I think uh, I think uh, you know the the patterns and and um, systems things. I think is really kind of what you have to kind of look at. So the, the movement patterns that they employ to try to hit a golf ball or putt or chip pitch, they've all got their own unique patterns that you have to manage, and you're, you know they're trying to kind of keep them sticking pretty close to their blueprint usually. And then the performance training actually looks quite different. It has to do with more task training and trying to, to build competence so that they feel more confident when they arrive at, a, at a, an event. So um, the, the, the tactical training is actually, um, you know, a lot more uh, internal focus probably, I would say, where, where it's probably done in front of a mirror, uh, using video, using feedback, using drills. And then the task training is really built more around uh, – giving the player a group of skills with some benchmarks to actually go out and, and try to attain over, over their practice sessions. And so, uh, give, us a, give us a standard day on benchmark with Patrick Reed. Okay. You meet him out in the woodlands at nine o'clock in the morning and you're going to be out there. I know him. He's going to want to be out there for six, seven hours with maybe a quick little lunch. Like what's going to happen in that benchmark day without going through all six or seven hours. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, all the players are a little bit different, but I think it, it always follows a basic playbook. And that is, you know, early in the week, uh, we'll try to let the players, if they've been out on the road, let them get a day's rest. And we normally get together on Tuesday and review video and try to look at all, you know, the, any, any technical projects that we need to get started for the week um, and get those started. Not a lot of, not a lot of task training, probably uh, through the, through uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll kind of, come back in and, and refocus on trying to make sure that the pattern work is moving the right direction and start working towards more, more of task training. So as we move towards Thursday, Friday, we're, we really kind of get into more um, having, you know, practice blocks set up for putting, chipping, pitching, um, bunker play and full swing. We run, we run through some, some practice blocks that are all built around mostly ball control and, uh, and being able to control their, you know, their, um, uh, uh, whether it's putting, making a certain amount of putts from, from short distances and a certain amount of, you know, being able to, to lag, um, you know, control their distance on their, on their longer putts. Uh, we also focus on, you know, shots around the green inside 30 yards, fairly rough and bunker, uh, pitching 30 to 150. And then full swing is, is basically going to be trajectory curves and tee shots. And so we actually, you know, write up a practice and give, it, and give them a list of tasks that they want, we want them to do and complete. Uh, I usually oversee that and uh, just to make sure it's running smoothly. And, uh, you know, we're looking at, at, at trying to achieve a, a success rate of probably about 80%. And so, you know, in terms of success rates, which seems to transfer into to good um, results, you know, as they start competing. 
I, lo I love it. A couple of uh, things for the toolbox there. I like task, task training a lot. And I like ball control. We're going to get into ball control, basically. And I think you, JP and Mark will agree with you as well, too. And certainly for me, we are in a ball control sport, a shot to spots uh, sport. And if the ball's not being controlled with every club, driver to putter, you're in trouble and you're not going to shoot very low score. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think it's really, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's, it's about being able to, to, to put the ball in play off the tee and then, you know, control your proximity to the second shots. And then when you miss, do miss greens, being able to, to uh, be competent enough with sh the short game skills and, and putt it well enough. And, and the benchmarks are pretty clear. It's not too hard to figure those out. I mean, we've got enough statistical information. God knows that, that we should be able to kind of figure out what good is. And so um, I think that's really, you know, so benchmarking it and then maybe having the training be about 10% tougher than the, the, the uh, desired performance benchmark seems to allow the players to, to, to move that into, you know, some sort, you know, have the, have the practice be transferable. You're on mute, Jamie. Lost your audio, Jamie. Better? Yeah. Gotcha. Oh. Hey, um, how long have you worked with Patrick Reed, Kev? Patrick and I started December 2011, so we've been get, we've been together a while. And um, so you're going on almost uh, a decade. You have be you have benchmarking for all of that. You have the data for no, all of those ten years. It was really yeah, actually, you know, it, it was really uh, it was it was funny. I I didn't get into really statistical benchmarking until you know the one thing about being around great players is they will call you out and make you better as a coach, and that's been my experience for sure. You know, after yeah, Patrick that's a ding 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 right there for everybody. You know, just they will call you out and make you a better coach, uh, regardless so, of whether they're a beginning player and definitely at the tour level. Yeah, and so I, I had, had been around Patrick for you know about a year and a half, and and he had gone through all the the uh, you know the um, <clears throat> Monday qualifying thing that he did, and then you know had has rookie year on tour, he wins his last event. Awesome. By now, I know I know that the way this kid rolls is. You know, he's going to finish up this event. We're going to celebrate for about 10 seconds, and he's going to turn to me and say, what's next? And so I contacted a statistician friend of mine in, uh, in Australia and had him run through Patrick's data. And uh, he came back to me with some things that I didn't, uh, that I did not know. And, and that, that was kind of the beginning of my use of statistical benchmarking. And from that point on, it became so clear that, you know, one of the problems that we have as coaches is being able to determine what good is. You know, I think there are some people that will fall on the low side of that where they say, well, okay, well, you know, they don't hold themselves to a high enough standard. But these tour players, sometimes they, their standards are too high, and they, all, they all have to be able to kind of soften themselves up to the, to the reality that, hey, you know, 70%, you know, 70% uh, success out here within a 5% kind of margin of error, you know, based on distance is actually world class. That's, that's all, that, that's good. And so, um, so anyway, learning learning that you know made it pretty easy because then we could actually benchmark the putting and the chipping and the you know yeah. the wedge play and the and the iron shots and the tee shots and and once the once the benchmarks were there, it became like a, a no brainer. You know, you just okay, there it is. There's good. Either you're you're good or not good. And so we could figure out on a week to week basis or day to day basis. Okay, you you're doing well. You know what's what's going well. What needs work and what's the plan. Yeah, I was going to say that, and I think this is for everybody out here, but, you know, for everybody else, what's our best teaching device, you know? Um, the the iPhone for me has been the best thing, and the voice memo sequence on the iPhone has been really helpful. And I've always, at the end of a long teaching day, have gone and made notes before I used to scribble out a little index card. And since this thing, I have voice memo notes. So at the end of the day, I'll turn down a song that I'm listening to that I like, and I'm just going to throw out three or four things, and then a chronological uh, puts it in my phone and I have it there and I can think about it later. And I think that's really important whether you're teaching somebody that's won a major championship or you're teaching just the regular person at home that you put your note down, notes down and remember where you are. And also too, I think we all agree with this, stay with your basics and stay what's worked. Don't try to reinvent something unless you have to. 
And that's where, you know, in our business, that's where you lose your job when you see a tour player and you go, what's going on? And you go, what are you working on? They go, I don't know what we're working on now. And when you talk to the great ones and you say, what are you working on? They can tell you exactly the same way that JP spoke about Harry or Mark spoke uh, about Mike Weir or you spoke about Patrick. So I think that's one that we enter in there. Gents, so many things in our game now are done with drills, swing aids, monitors, track man, power plates, et cetera. How much of this uh, you do is technology based as opposed to instinct based? JP, I'll start with you. Uh, you can't use anything on the golf course. So, you know, uh, Butch's old man used to say that if you're working, if you're not working on something that you can use on a Sunday on the back nine, you're wasting your time. So, and I think that, you know, I've always tried, certainly with the better players, to approach what I'm doing with that mentality in mind that, you know, of course it's. Can you repeat that one more time for everybody? If you're, not work, if you're not working on something that you can use on the back nine on a Sunday, you're wasting your time. So, of course, he's alluding to the fact that, you know, if you're not practicing something that you're actively going to do under duress in a tournament situation, you're probably wasting your time. So if you're... I got a bunch of good players in my office and we all just look at each other and smile. That kind of summed it up. You want to wrap it up? <laughs> that means I'm... Keep going. Yeah. Um, so, you know, diagnostic tools are fantastic. I, I mean, I was very fortunate that when we opened the golf school, you know, with uh, Claude in Dubai in 2009, we bought all of that stuff. We bought TrackMan and 3D and Sam and things like that. And it was awesome. And at the, at the beginning, we're giving people all this biomechanical information and data and things like this. And people didn't really, nor did they understand, they didn't understand it and they didn't really need it either. So, you know, the tools in your toolbox, they're for you a lot of the times with all of those diagnostic tools. I, I mean, a, a doctor doesn't go through how an MRI machine works for a client or doesn't show him everything. He's just going to share with the client what the client needs. Um, I think some teaching aids, I think, you know, going back to Kevin's kind of point about, you know, what a, what a Tuesday, you know, a Monday afternoon or a Tuesday might look like being able to use some teaching aids to develop some different fields to be able to, you know, use some things to 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 put certain joints into place and to have some stable sort of fabric in your in your technical work. I think can be very very useful. Um, but again, it's been a long time since I saw Jamie, Mark, or Kevin using a lot of teaching aids on the range at a PGA Tour event, um, especially during warm ups. They'll uh, they'll be nowhere to be seen really. Well, we we see one or two players, I must say, but um, infrequently. Mark, same thing, please. Yeah. Let me do the I, question I, again. Sorry. Let me do the question again, or you got it? No, no, no. I mean, I think that's right. Like the goal is to put a player in a position so when they can use the information you're giving them in competition when it matters. I do think that the technology allows players to be able to create feels, thoughts, and their own sort of understanding of information and so technology gets a bad rap right i mean it's useful it's essential in in its right place but it's still not going to hit the goal shots for you so i think the art to it if, if you want to talk about the artistic part of coaching is taking the scientific pieces and translating it for the player in front of you and every player speaks a different language and so us as a coach has to be a chameleon to be able to basically translate the information in the reference frame that the player will understand. And I don't think unless you've coached a lot of players from different levels, people look at us and they see people coaching tour players, which is a privilege, but we're also trying to do no harm. And so sometimes the player's not going to be able to take on the information that perhaps we want them to have in a technical aspect. So we have to dumb it down and deliver it how they'll understand it. And that's one thing I don't think people appreciate enough that every single player is very different. And most tour players are really good at doing stuff. A lot of times they don't know how they do it. And so we have to figure that out. And the technology to me is a great medium to be able to take their feels and create an objective understanding of it from our perspective. And then we allow and help them together create those fields and thoughts where they can have something that they can gravitate to when push comes to shove on the back nine on Sunday to try and win a golf tournament. So I think that the hard part is being able to take the technical 
and then translate it, dumb it down to the player. And as I always say, sometimes you've got to deliver a message very, very differently. So I've been to church with some players and I've been to strip clubs with other players. Whatever it takes to be able to get the information to the player. Yeah, I, I, I hung on every word there. And Kevin, I know you well enough. I don't think you and I need to add anything to either one of those answers. I think it's to those were just unbelievably stated. Really, really nice, gentlemen. Thank you. Kev, and I'll start with you on this, but I do want to get everybody's take. And I, and I know that you and I have had this conversation at dinner like two or three times. Like um, in our business, you can tell who's doing a good job. You can tell who... Um, who knows how to swing and who's getting worked on the right way and who's playing really well. And you can almost go up and down the range and you can see also when they're not in the right mode. And it also, one of the things I admire about all three of you gentlemen and Kevin, I'll have you speak to that because I know that you and I have talked about it a lot is I think all of our players, they, they look really different aesthetically in the way that they swing. They look different in their body types and there isn't a method that any of us are going for actually with our players. You look at the difference between Charlie Hoffman and Chez Reeve, there's quite a big difference in that, you know? Um, you look in the difference between Patrick Reed and Lexi Thompson, there's a big difference in the way that that looks, you know? Not everybody can look like Louis Eustace and JP, you know, but it's very interesting to see Brian Harmon beat him in tournaments as well, too. So they're all kind of doing different things. How did you become so diverse in what that you did, Kevin? And how did you decide that you were going to take the person and make him swing the way that you wanted to or play the way that you wanted to without just sticking into one method? And why did you move a, move away from a method and become more of, as Mark said, a chameleon? I think it's a good point, Jamie. I think, you know, it's, you know, when I, when I started coaching, I was, I was, it was really I was had still trying to kind of sort out kind of the way I understood and, and the way I perceived and what I thought would be best practice. And so my, my initially my coaching with high performance and recreational players was really about trying to look at their patterns and trying to understand and explain why they performed the way they did. And in 2014, I had the craziest experience that just flipped the whole thing on its nose. I, you know, I was at, uh, I'd gone to the, to the, to the, um, the, uh, Ryder cup with Patrick and, and, uh, he and, Jordan were playing in a match with uh, in a pod with um, Jim Furyk and and Matt Kutcher and the young guys were playing the old guys and uh, they were gambling it up to just trying to kind of keep keep it competitive during the during the practice rounds and I just, I watched Jim Furyk single handedly field dress those kids I mean he beat them out of a couple grand a piece uh -huh. and he he did it with confidence you know but because he could put put the ball in play off the tee and then when he hit an iron shot on the green it was usually around the hole you know pretty close to the hole and if you missed the green for some reason uh if he didn't chip it in he tapped it in and then every time he had a putt it looked like it was going in and so i walked away from that and he was the you know watching him play there was nothing that would suggest that he should be able to beat any of those players and so i started rethinking it and trying to say well okay well maybe it is about about you know understanding you know, becoming more competent and maybe my job may not be to try to steer them down some sort of road that I think they should be moving down, you know, technically, but try to understand how they move. And, you know, as Mark said earlier, you know, we're always at risk of, you know, of, of, of doing, doing more harm than good. At this level, it's easy to, to, to really mess somebody up by trying to take them down some sort of road that you don't need to take them down. So I spent more, a lot more time in the last five, five or six, maybe 10 years, trying to understand that the athletes, how they move, what they're, you know, how they have generated their success up to that point and trying to try to find maybe the least invasive thing I can do to help them instead of trying to, to repattern pattern it, to make it, to make it happy for, you know, make, you know, but make it something that, that, that I like to see or pleasing to the eye. I mean, watching, mm -hmm. watching Jim Furyk play golf would never, you would never suggest that any of that looks like it should be effective yet. He was one of the best players of his, of his era. So, it was a really valuable lesson to me, and, and I, I, I've, I learned a lot from that, from that experience. And so, you know, my, my philosophy about that kind of going forward is to try to understand each player, how they move, you know, to Mark's point earlier, you know, how they think, what their golf IQ is, how much technology can they tolerate, and, uh, and try to come up with something that's going to allow them to, to get better. Excellent answer as well, too. JP, you want to expound on that one? Yeah, I think 
for me, it was always a keen interest in people. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate that I love, I love being around people. I like talking to people. And I think in our industry, if you don't want to be around people and chat with people and talk with people, you're probably better off doing something else. But as I learned about people, the differences in people's backgrounds, whether that be cultural, spending so many years, you know, living in the Middle East and um, looking at the, the different sports that people play, you know, Mark and I grew up playing soccer, you know, we, we would have done that all the way through our teens. And you look at the, the, the way that that sort of development would have had our lower bodies compared to a baseball player, for example. Um, you know, so from a, you know, from a background through to the way that people are so completely different psychologically. Um, to the way that they will then, you know, form their opinions and form their ideas as golfers and, and, and the coaching that they would have had, the time with which they started playing golf. Everyone is so, so different. I, I always thought it was almost, um, it would be a travesty of justice to try and stick people all in, in the same sort of bucket. So for me, it was, it was, never, it was never something, it, it would never be a question for me to go and look at a method. It, that's just would be to, nonsensical in my opinion. But you know, from, from that point, uh, you know, having had access to, you know, some great instructors, you know, like you've got here and with Butch and Claude and Pete Kahn and plucking some of the best little pieces from all of those uh, different systems and, and maybe having some benchmarks that are, you know, almost like little bumps in the road that we can say, right, well, we can go to that point, but we might not go any further than that. And I think for me, that's all pretty much internal now. So, you know, when I, when I look at Brian Harmon's, you know, club face alignments, he gets the golf club wide open going back and you know, Harris is way out in front of his hands. And, you know, and I, I marvel at some of the, you know, some of the guys like DJ and, and Brooks who play from such strong positions. You know, when we look at all those different different human beings and different athletes, um, I don't think it would be fair to, to, to ever try and get people to swing the golf club or play in the same way. Yeah, great answer there. Uh, development of juniors all the way to the elite, Mark. Um, what what you think? Like, watch them take them from young kid to uh, they become tour player. Why don't you talk about that a bit? I think that the the key is there's lots of kids that get into golf traditionally because they've tried everything else and they're not necessarily the best athletes. But if you look at someone you're trying to really develop, you're going to have a lot more success with folks that have a lot more physical literacy and athletic development so to speak coordinated that can generate especially now speed so athletes that played lots of other sports to me and that's something we try and nurture and cultivate here at Greystone with our junior program is that look we're trying to make them a coordinated kid that can move can do things well that gives me much better clay to mold with I feel like it's fairly easy to teach somebody to play the game, to swing, all of those other pieces, but they need to have the coordination and the athleticism to really capitalize on that. Now, on the other side, there are plenty of kids who may not be that talented, physically speaking, but have a great work ethic, and that is their superpower and talent, and they're able to accomplish amazing things by purely hard graft, grit, working at it, and they kind of supersede those kids that are very athletic. And then sometimes you get the perfect match where you get the athleticism and the hard work. And that's your Patrick Cantlay. That's your, you know, your phenomenal players. But the goal is to develop the athlete first so that they can enjoy the game. They can hit the ball a better distance. They've got a little bit more variability in what they're able to do. Um, and I, to me, that's all I'm ever trying to do with juniors is give them the ability and the framework early so that they can hit the ball a long way and then we'll figure out how to make it go straight and teach them to play the game. And to me, that's the most important part. And get them on the golf course. Don't get them on the range all the time. Show them how to play the game, even if it's with a tennis racket or a hockey stick and a tennis ball, nav navigating the golf course and getting out there, putting them in situations. My sort of preference is always let them figure out how to create energy, then figure out how to play the game and then hit different shots. And then we'll fall into the swing and those other things kind of where they are as they develop physically, psychologically. But that, to me, that's the, the developmental model that works better as opposed to, here you go, go hit us some golf balls. You need to do this, you need to do that. I try and lead them and let them develop their own, if you like, individuality as a player, 
and as a swinger of the club and then just make sure that they can generate speed. That's my that's my prerogative, really. Yeah, good answer again. Um, I'm going to ask myself the same question just on, you know, juniors and juniors to elite. And um, somebody asked me the other day this in an interview, but I think the easy way to put it, you know, most tour player coaches get tour players after they become tour players. And our deal, you know, I'm not sure if I had a whole bunch of success at making a tour player after he became a tour player, a much better tour player. But our forte has been to develop somebody from the time that they're really, really young and then develop them through learning how to play kid golf, which is nine old, like kind of tournament matches to junior golf, to AGGA, to college, and then become a professional. I think we've seen 15 people now that we either grew up with or that we started now become PGA or LPGA players in three generations. And now we've got a fourth generation of some 17, 18 and 19 year old, 20 year old players. There's three or four of them that have the opportunity to do the same thing. And I wanted to throw out a couple things there that I think would be helpful for all. There is something distinctly different about the tour player and call it the X factor, call it what you want, but having the opportunity to teach a thousand people that wanted to play on tour and only 15 that did, there was something special that each and every one of them did. And I don't want to, you know, go through, take all your time away by telling you each one spot, but I can tell you there's like a gold nugget time where you drive away and you go, they're going to be really special and it just happens and you got to be able to identify that. And then you got to go all in as far as that goes. And all in might be meeting with the parents and saying, hey, by the way, I think your 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 son or daughter could play on tour. And this is what we need to do. And then you got to kind of build the whole concept, what we would call our wheel concept, to get them all into what they're going to do and make sure you get all the right spokes in the wheel so it can round straight. And then I was also going to tell you, too, that at the end of it, the sum of all those parts becomes their attitude that they want to be great. And great would mean that they have to be in love with it. And in love with it means that they got to want to do it when it's raining or when they're not playing well or whatever that they are. And they just want to keep going back out there. And they realize that it's a marathon and not a sprint. And then the last part I wanted to throw out there, not that it's not fun as a business, but I think, you know, JP, I'm looking at you in the eye and Kevin, I'm looking at, uh, I mean, I can hear you and Mark, I'm looking at you in the eye as we're speaking, but we all know this. It's a business now for us guys, right? And it's a business in the fact that they're very serious about what they're doing and not that it's not fun because I think we're still having fun with it and trying to make them have fun with it. But the most fun time is when they become 16, 17, 18, 19 years old and it's not a business yet. There isn't an agent and they're learning how to play and they're learning how to become great players. And that's when they really stretch their wings and fly a little bit. So if you get them to that point, have some fun with it and enjoy it. And then the next thing you know, 20 or 30 years later, you realize they're Paul Goidos or they're John Cook and you got to watch them fly for a long, long time. But when you talk, even when we're having dinner with those guys, we're still talking about what it was like when they were younger because that's when they developed into being great. Um, Next question, Kevin, what's the difference for you between coaching and teaching? And I know on tour, most of us that are out there all the time, we're coaching and not teaching, but why don't you explain the difference between coaching and teaching, please? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, coaching to me is, uh, or teaching is actually leading somebody through, is, is, is more taking kind of a leadership role in the learning process. So it's, it's actually me taking the reins and saying, okay, this, this we're going to focus on these things. Uh, and that's what teaching is to me. Learning, I mean, uh, uh, coaching has to do more with being a, in a more supportive role for the player, trying to trying to figure out, okay, how what can I do to help this person kind of get from A to B, and try to try to figure out the the, the things that that I can bring to the table and bring to that process that are going to allow them to 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 get to where they want to go. So one of them is actually, you know, so that's where, it, that's where it kind of, that's, you know, it, in a, in a two minute, you know, breakdown, that's good. That's the way it sits with me. Good. Good answer. Um, the masters are coming up, you know, this is our, we're all thinking about it, you know, um, I promise I'm going to buy you guys the best fried chicken when we're in Augusta one night if we're able to slip outside of our bubble and go have a piece of chicken. Um, with the with that coming up, what's your best experience? And it doesn't have to exactly be about golf at Augusta so far, JP. Um, 
I want to I'll share a, a fun experience. Like you, know, you get to the range at Augusta, and you you know you you kind of pinch yourself and wonder what you're you're doing here. But I watched Fred Couples, who's always been a hero of mine, coming out onto the putting green, and you know Fred kind of sauntered out there. And you know I think it'd be fair to say that everybody's nervous at Augusta. I think even Fred Couples is probably nervous. But it's a you know it's a Tuesday, and he you know he's coming out, and and he threw three golf balls down, and he literally hit them across the green one after the other without any care in the world as to where they were going or what was happening. And I watched him very closely doing this and I thought to myself, you know, what he's doing at the moment and what I thought he was doing was just trying to take his intensity levels and bring them right the way down to the floor so that he was so relaxed and kind of calm and, and almost cavalier about it that at least that's where he can start the week. He can start the week with just rolling those three balls across the green with no real care as to consequences or anything like that. And it was amazing to me to see a player as gifted and as you know someone who I've admired, you know, the rhythm of his golf swing and things like that. But but even he's having to you know to go to those little go to those little lengths just to be able to you know get control of his faculties at a venue that's so special. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mark. Yeah. Uh. Lots of Augusta memories. Uh, I kind of like the old range at Augusta. That's always special. I remember uh, back in 07. It's 07 you can or I could hit the fence, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but probably my best Augusta uh, yeah, memories, just that old range. I remember my dad, when he was still alive, he came over for one Masters, and the, the only people on the range were Robert Carlson and I, and that was kind of funny with a full grandstand, and my dad's up there. So... But that's kind of cool. The old range is definitely something I remember. And then it's just a cool experience, like being there. Some of the things every year, what do they do new? They do something that's completely different. Apparently this year we've got credentials, which is the first time ever. So I'm interested to see what that entails. So Augusta's just a unique experience, right? It's kind of, you never know what you're going to get. Um, sometimes it has some coaching challenges, but it's a great place to be and the ambience, the atmosphere and, Kind of all of the things that go along with it are, are really really cool and obviously one thing i would say is the coolest thing having fortunate enough to now coach someone who won not that i got them to win is getting to go with a master's champion breakfast lunch snacks everything in the champion's locker room and you basically uh -huh. you kind of, you're treated a little bit differently so that is really cool and special so i look forward to being there uh, in a few weeks yeah Kevin, before I get to you, because I got a pretty good idea of what your answer is, but one thing that I was going to tell you, everybody that's on the call, if you're a PGA member and you haven't taken advantage of your opportunity to go and when they have fans again, you have to go. It's mandatory. And then as Mark said, one of the kind of cool things is that we don't credential like we do at a normal tournament. We have a credential and we just come right in the front door with everybody. We actually go to the PGA line and we walk through and there's something it can be a bit of a hassle. It can be a bit of a challenge managing that around warm-ups, but there's something about that I kind of like. And then also, too, just the crowds are so knowledgeable. You know, last year, Patrick shot 64 on day three, and Dario won the thing, and we walked on the range on Saturday morning on Saturday morning, him and I, and just some other person out there. And um, the crowd gave him an, an ovation, which... You know, it's just Patrick Guy and the caddy walking out. You don't hear that very much walking on the driver ends. There's something cool about the place. It, it makes the hair on my arm standing up just thinking about it. And I can't wait for a couple, three weeks to get there. Kevin, go ahead, bud. Yeah, I mean, I think the Masters is obviously an interesting place. I heard Pete Cowan say one time that it, uh, it's everything that's right and everything that's wrong with golf in the same place. And I think that's kind of a bold statement. But I do think that and it has a very – a very special you know um it's just a very special place and uh you know i was fortunate enough to watch a kid that i coached spot on a green jacket it was just the most surreal um so week awesome. of my life and um you know i can think back on that week and so many experiences and so many things that happened but one of the the things that happened after the event that, that i will never ever forget was they have a they have a, a members dinner right after the after the uh, award ceremony to to uh, welcome the new, the new champion and so that particular night Pat, patrick had a good, big group of people and i had I, I had a caddy that i had promised to ride to the airport and we were trying to kind of get out of there so i gave up my seat at this table that that, that they that they were going to have the, the, the seat 10 people the champion plus nine other people uh they seat them 
in front of the, the, the master's membership and uh, uh, basically, you know, introduce the new champion. So uh, anyway, my, uh, my experience was that uh, I, I decided to, to leave this meeting, uh, this dinner. And so I'm walking across the, the um, right, by, right by the tent green. I mean, right, right by number 10 T in the putting green. And I'm walking across in the dark. There's a big full moon out. And there's stars out. And it's a kind of, a, you know, a nice crisp April night. And I'm, I realized that I'm the only person on the property. It was the most, it was the craziest thing. I mm-hmm. stood there and it brought me to my knees. I literally fell down on my knees and started crying. I could not believe that I was out there. That's awesome. And I sat there on my knees and I cried for cried my eyes out for about two minutes just to get out of, out of just exhaustion and excitement and, and just, the, awesome. you know, the, the spiritual experience that I was having in that moment. And I, after I gathered myself up, I kind of collected myself up and I walked across the property uh, by myself in the dark uh, to my car and I hopped off and I, 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 and I drove off the property. I, I mean, it was just the most amazing thing, you know, uh, <clears throat> something that, you know, I, I don't know anybody else has been on that property at night. Uh, when it's empty, uh, but it's being like, like being in a church. I mean, there's something about being in a church full of people, and there's another thing about being in a church that's empty, you know? And uh, that was that, an absolute most incredibly spiritual, uh, just right to the core of my being experience I've ever had in golf. Oh, man, I have chills in my, in my, in my, me listening to you tell that story. That's awesome. Um, this year will be interesting with no fans. You know, I, I, we've been saying all along, I think we've all said this to each other, but on tour right now, because there's no fans, it's like watching a college tournament with really good players, better players than college players. So it's going to be interesting to be at Augusta with nobody out, out there. Thanks for sharing that. And thanks for the, the heartfelt uh, stuff, Kevin. I've never heard that before. That was a great story. Um, there's so much in our game now. Like if you think about this, when we started doing this, you know, for me back in the middle eighties, the players didn't look like they look now and uh, everybody looks like they could play a different sport and they're fit. And the days used to last six or seven hours, not that the players weren't working hard, but now it's like everybody's on a 12 hour day. By the time you put physio and workout, warm up, practice, warm down, workout, physio, couple nutritious meals. Why don't you talk about that? And JP, why don't you start just about the, the health element in our game and what we're seeing? You know, I, I think you've got to be in front of it. I think even if you're if you're teaching serious, semi-serious golfers at your club, I think you've got to be in front of it. I think having a having a relationship, you know, for for, for us, and I know, you know, the, the the four of us, we have a relationship with caddies, we have a relationship with managers, and um, more recently, we have a relationship with trainers. And I think trainers are even morphing into um, PTs and uh, movement specialists, and I think you know we're, we're going to see more and more of that as as time moves on. I think a uh, you know a, a movement specialist can really you know begin to help you as a golf coach or a golf teacher understand why players will will move the way that they do, and and possibly be able to give you some answers as to how to unlock um, some things that you'd like unlocked in their golf swings. And certainly, I mean, I've worked. Uh, you know, closely with a lot of guys from, you know, Kevin Duffy's always somebody that I mentioned because Kev's been a been a great influence on what I've done. Um, Louis Eustazen has, has had Kevin on his team on and off really for the last, let's say, eight or 10 years. And Kevin helps me understand, you know, when Louis, you know, begins to, to creep into some of the swing faults, albeit that he always swings the golf club with wonderful rhythm. Um, but, you know, when he when he gets a little bit of pelvic thrust, when he starts moving towards the golf ball a little bit too much, when he doesn't adequately load his right side during the backswing um, and when certain segments will get a little bit off balance. And he'll, you know, he'll he'll describe it like Rubik's cubes. You know, Kevin will say that, you know, you kind of from your cervical down through your diaphragm down into your abdominal section, into your core, everything can be twisted off balance and then once something's twisted off balance something else is going to kind of twist to be able to try and get things back into balance so um you know i think that uh, it's certainly a part of the a part of the whole adventure that i really really enjoy i love working with i love working with trainers t- telling them what i'm seeing asking them whether there's anything that they're seeing that correlates to something that we can kind of get done in the gym that we don't even maybe have to get into um, and I, you know, I think as, as I say, it's a, watching what Bryson's done, you know, chat with, with Chris Como more recently, it's, it's incredible the levels that he's taken it to. Um, 
He's certainly taken it to the same sort of level that you would find in, you know, in UFC or NFL or something like that. And I think, uh, you know, more power to him. I, you know, the golf is still very much a long career. And I just hope that, you know, in, in making these extremely explosive movements and, you know, the types of nutrition package and things that you know, we don't see some sort of drop off, you know, for, for some players. But, you know, that being said, when we talk about it being a business, you know, these guys can make enough money to happily retire in the space of five years of great golf. So, you know, maybe we're just going to see great, great spells of golf from fewer players over shorter periods of time compared to the Bernhard Langer, Tom Watsons that we've seen in the past. Yeah. One of the trainers walking down the range last week when we were at Shadow Creek and um, one of the other players looked at me and said, hey, he's number 38 on the money list to the trainer. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, That'll be okay. Trainer makes a lot of money. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, Mark, I want to ask you the same question, but I want to live back to or go back to what you just uh, said there. Uh, the Bryson formula i mean it's been so intriguing it seems like we all go through a quarter where we're asked out a bunch of stuff you know this year has been COVID at the start and now it's Bryson DeChambeau like what do you think there JP what I think what what Bryson has done yeah in a couple I, think, of I think it's incredible I think you know with again you know with Chris Cobo who's kind of to some degree, I, I would I would refer to him as a you know he's an interlink between the world of biomechanics, strength and conditioning, and, and golf instruction, and you know, he's done a very good job within that um, capacity to, to be able to to link in there and and take that project really to well we're not sure I mean is he going to pitch up at Augusta with a 48 inch driver and you know even greater ball speed I, I'm not I'm not quite sure but. You know, certainly it's been interesting to see it. Um, it's made me think about, you know, how kind of set in stone I get about some things and, you know, how, the, you know, we really need to, we have a responsibility to move with the times. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, he, at the end of the day, you can't take anything away from his performance at Wingfoot. You know, he was fabulous on the Sunday and, I, I, you know, he, he was a great champion. And, you know, we could say that maybe on the Saturday in U.S. Opens in the past had the players played with that level of inaccuracy, they would have been more heavily penalized for it. But at the same time, you know, he's the guy with uh, the US Open trophy. And the lowest score, right? Yeah. Yeah. Low score. Same thing, just same thing. We've evolved into a, you know, and I know that you're into it all the way from, you know, mind, body and spirit. It's fun to talk to you about it. You also have a take on many things. You know, I, I had a kick with our, our dinner a couple of weeks ago with Dave Phillips just talking about what Phil's doing with the energy drink and Seems like somebody's always talking to us about that stuff. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? You know, they are healthier, and we're making them healthier, and people are making them healthier. You asked that to me. Yes, okay. sir. Yeah, no, I think that all in all, you're you're trying to essentially help everybody play towards their own capacity, right? Nutrition, what you eat, what you put in your body is definitely a part of that, and I think every player is looking for. What's the lowest hanging fruit to help them improve? Some folks may, nutrition, what you put in your body really is probably the easiest thing that you can control. Um, you know, as you've usually alluded to, back in the day when you started coaching on tour, they drank Cokes. Well, now you wouldn't go near a Coke, right? They, they drink water out, their hydration, what they're having, how they fuel themselves on the golf course, and then the neurological, psychological implications of that are huge. So I think Everything is trying to help the player that you have perform the best they can. And what are the easiest ways to do that? And essentially, your body is your most important piece of equipment, whether you like it or not. And as JP said, we may see golfers a bit like tennis players. They're going to be a lot more explosive. If you want to dominate, your body is probably going to have to be trained a little bit differently. It may not longevity wise be as resilient to injury. So your window may be shorter. So you're going to have to work really hard for a short period of time. Now, that could all change if there was some type of adjustment to rules. But at the end of the day, the bigger, stronger, faster you are, you still have a massive advantage. So you can either embrace that, somewhat adapt to it, and then try and help people based on their own skill set in, improve that. And every, any edge, whatever it may be, Mickelson's done well with coffee, you know, trying to have that. And he's kind of lost some weight. Maybe that's his thing. I think everybody's different. What I do know is that 
you can't make Bryson's recipe work for somebody else. It has to be all based on what the player wants to do. And us as coaches, we're trying to make sure that we allow the player to be themselves, yet how far are they willing to go to put themselves to, to get better? And, that, and that's the hard part. I'm always interested in a player that's willing to do whatever it takes to get better. That's exciting to me. And sometimes you've got to be encouraging players to do other things. But there's no question you can't say, hey, I'm not going to work out. I'm not going to do anything to take care of my body. I'm just going to, you know, do it how they used to do it back in the 50s and 60s because I just don't think you can compete week in, week out with the players that are doing the other things. And guess what? The kids in college are doing it already. So it's part of their daily routine. And if you look at ball speeds and the, what college kids do, Matt Wolf, yes, he's an anomaly, but he's, there's lots of college kids that smash it like he did and have been doing it. So now they get to the tour and now they've added that category where they get status in college. It's just really tough if your ball speed's, you know, 165 and the kid coming out of college is 185, 190 and he's cruising and he doesn't have to swing that hard within himself to do that. That's a tough thing to compete with over the long haul. Yeah, well stated. You know, when we first started coaching Luke List, like he, you know, sent it. He was number one in driving distance, and he's always going to be in the top ten in driving distance. It just goes a long ways, and he's a big athlete, you know, and now it's more efficient than it's ever been. And we kind of got him away. You know, he had become a bit of a long driving freak show. People wanted to see him hit it, and we decided that, you know, a decade ago we were never going to ask him to do that. I maybe had a time with Veronica when we were down at a clinic in the desert where he really sent it. But a lot of people that are on the call probably saw him and we saw him send it, but it's really the only time that I've ever seen him kind of rev it up. He said this year at Detroit, the first call at Detroit's like 420 and it was his Tuesday practice round and his body felt great. It was kind of hot. He walked out with his caddy later in the afternoon and he hit a tee shot on the first hall and just sequenced everything per perfect and stacked one right in the middle, you know, and killed it down there. And he was, you know, basically chipping onto the green 40 or 50 yards away in the holes. I don't know, 415, 420, something like that. No win, but he just killed one down there. When he's telling me that, I'm thinking, wow, that's a long ways on that hole. I know that hole. That's an awful long ways. Then he said he got down there to do his practice work from behind the green, him and his caddy, and all of a sudden he heard a ball land on the front edge, and it was Bryson. So when you think about somebody that hits it farther than anybody out and somebody hit it way farther than him, it kind of blows us away. And Every week when we're on the road, we see that. Let's bounce around and do some quick ones, okay? Mark, for the average player, are you measuring stats? and uh, kind of keeping benchmarks and tracing for the 10 handicap or the 20 handicap or the 30 handicap? Yeah, I would say you're looking at what are the areas based on their game that you need to focus on. And some okay. folks, it's like you just, to the individual, yes, I, did you do this this week or how did you do in that, that area? Because that's what's essential for that person to score. Your club golfers, they're all a little bit different, but yes. Cool. Uh, Kevin, um, as far as like watching somebody play golf, are you, and one of the reasons that I love these three guys is I think a big part of what we do is you got to watch golf and you're on the golf course and you're watching golf. What made you decide that you're going to watch golf as much as you do Kevin or Mark or JP and Kevin, why don't you start? Yeah, I, for me, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we can, the, the, the practicing of golf is interesting, but the playing of golf is really what, the, what the guys are actually paid to do. And so it's their, it's the ebb and flow of, of kind of the, the rounds of golf to, to, that you watch. It's to watching the players, the way they handle success and adversity. Uh, it's, you know, when, when they get going either really good or really bad, it's just, it's just, I think it's really important as a coach to be able to kind of watch that. I mean, in other, all the other games on the planet, the coach watches the whole game every day, you know? So, I mean, and, and so I, I think it's, it's hard to coach specifically, you know, your, your, your world-class players, without watching them play. I think it's I think it's just imperative that you do it. Great. Same same thing, JP. I mean I agree agree with Kevin. I mean I think of it from a from a soccer point of view, you know, if you're the if you're the soccer coach, the team coach, and you know, you go to the practice on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then on the match day on Saturday you think, right lads, I'll see you later. I'm I'm not gonna be around. So you know, I think you you know whenever you get an opportunity to you've got to get out there and see your players perform. I mean you know the, the the golf swing stuff and again this goes back to the some of the diagnostic things and you see it you know you can see some great stuff on the pga tour 
um, stats and, and the way they're re recording every single tee shot these days. You know, we work pretty much on about a 13% gain between Louis playing and practicing on a Tuesday and a Wednesday and what we actually see coming out of the barrel on a Thursday and a Friday. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing a very, very different um, comp set of material whenever they're whenever they're using all of their using all of their adrenaline and using all of their intensity levels. So you really are seeing the, the true athlete when you're watching them play golf. You, you know, you're not going to see that on a, on a Tuesday and a Wednesday in many cases. Mark? Yeah, I think there's no substitute for watching them play and seeing how they navigate different situations. And you get to appreciate how good they really are. Some of the shots that you actually see them hit are unbelievable. So I, I think that that's a, a really important part of playing as a coach, you've got to be able to go watch them, play, perform, execute. There's no substitute for it. And, and that's where the true learning is because you get to see whether they follow their strategic tactical game plans. Like sometimes they make some errors which are, you know, a bit like tennis, an unforced error, and purely it was what triggered that and their decision making that led to it. You can't see that on shot link or any of the other things, but you can see that when you're there and sometimes those errors compound and cause big issues and it, instead of it being a catastrophic problem it's like look you just made an error why did you deviate from that that you were planning to do and sometimes there's a logical reason for it but you wouldn't know that unless you were out watching it's not going to happen on a flat driving range too sometimes that five iron that they missed twice is out of a little weird rough into a little weird wind might have been a miscommunication between them and the caddy, and there was a reason for the five iron. It didn't have anything again to do with their left wrist at the top, of, at the top of the swing. Um, I was going to say, you know, I get to watch golf almost every day when I'm home. You know, especially with this next generation, they're out playing golf late in the afternoon. I'm the cruise out and watch them. And I, I have to tell you guys this, since you're all three on the call together, one of my favorite things uh, that goes on in our professional life is when one of my guys get paired with one of your guys. And we get to walk along and watch golf. I think it's really cool. I'm really fortunate to be able to share what we know about the game and talk and to watch them do their deal. It's just super special. So thank you for that, gents. Um, best wing on tour, Mark. Who, who is it for you? Or do quick hitters for a while? Great question. Best swing. The best yeah. swing I like to look at, would you say? Best, best swing on tour. Right now, it's probably Bryson. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> JP, what do you got? I've always loved that. I've, I love Adam Scott's golf swing. I mean, I think he's, yeah. a, he's a fabulous player. He's a fabulous athlete. He's got wonderful posture. He's annoyingly good looking and he's such a nice bloke as well. That, you know, he makes me jealous every time I, I see him. But, you know, he's got he's got speed. He's got great lines. He, the, the club face is very stable going through the bottom. And I, I, I think it's a golf swing that you can – you know, you can, again, take pieces from it and say, you know, this is probably some of the best practice that we see. It's interesting what you said, because we quote a lot of pieces in swings, his posture, his backswing, he has quoted a lot, too. You put mm -hmm. him in Mark's hoodie, he would be really something special, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, Kevin, what about you? Yeah, I, I like Adam Scott's motion at it, too. Uh, um, I think... Um, I like. I, I keep going back to some of the Tiger around 2000. I still kind of just marvel at, at you know the, the combination of kind of movement quality and speed and control that that he had during that period of time. And uh, the more modern players, you know, and that guy that fascinates me is Henrik Stenson. I mean, the guy that can just absolutely flush it, just almost every time he swings at it. And so uh, those are the guys that that capture my attention and I you know keep cycling back around and and. Um, so that's my quick answer on that. Give me a sleeper one that you wouldn't think of. JP, who you got? Say again, Jimmy? A sleeper one that some you wouldn't think of, that you're walking down like this This person's catching your eye. You know, I, I would encourage anyone who hasn't to have a little look at Brian Harmon. I know I work with Brian, and that's yeah. a little bit a yeah. you know, difficult one. But, but Harmon threw the golf ball in terms of his rotations and the way he's able to – remain in posture and things he's a he's a fabulous athlete and you know he's not a he's not a tall guy but i think um you know had he been born with dustin johnson's frame with the movement patterns that he can put on it um he would have been uh, even better than he is than he is and he's a he's a fabulous player i like the fact he wanted to bet on the bracer at the dodgers too that makes me like him even more um 
Mark, how about you? Who's the sleeper for you? Oh, I'd have to say right now, Hoffman, I like the way Charlie swings it. I mean, I'm saying that he stays in his like question. Your guys. Yeah, yeah, he's better too. You've done fabulous work with him. Kevin, who do you like? A sleeper. No. Yeah, there's a there's a, a bunch of, of young players out there, but I tell you who's really captured my attention. You know, you start kind of looking at that really next generation of kind of young kids coming up. Uh, I think you know, and he's already already won a major, so he's not like he's a sleeper. But I love watching Colin uh, Carlos swing the golf club. It seems like he's yeah. You know, him and Rick have done a really nice job of organizing themselves around kind of the way he, you know he moves. You know, it just it's it's pleasant to the eye, and uh, you know it looks like it should repeat and be really super healthy for a long period of time. Yeah, I like it a lot. I think you're right. We have Rick on tomorrow. I think everybody that's on this call is going to get to hear him tomorrow, so they're excited about that. LPGA player, who do you like? Mark, I'll start with you. Some really good ones out there. I mean, in terms of how she delivers the club and the way, not it's not going to look pretty, but if she's effective, I still think Lexi's a great athlete. I mean, I think that that typifies the fact that you've got someone who's athletic who sends the ball a long way. I mean, I know she's one of Kirk's girls, but I still think that that's impressive. It's showing that the athleticism is there and it doesn't necessarily stylistically need to be what we all perceive as pretty and you know, flowing. Do you know what I mean? I, I think we need to look at golf a little bit differently from that standpoint. Yeah, JP? I'm going to go in a completely different direction and say Anne Van Damme. She's got, again, great yeah. line. Beautiful balance, um, yeah. definitely puts the club on it pretty well. I know she, uh, I'm a follower on Instagram, I don't, don't think she had a great week last week, but you know, certainly somebody who, um, you know, from a, you know, an aesthetic and an athletic perspective, um, you know, ticks a lot of boxes and, and what I like to see. Yeah, yeah, got some hit on her ball too. Kevin? I've got three people on my mind. I think uh, I like to watch the quarter sisters swing it. I think they've done a nice job of organizing themselves. Uh, like Mel Reed's golf swing. Uh, I think yeah. she swings it nicely. And uh, little gal with uh, Veronica. I mean, I know she, she hasn't really, you know, she hadn't got herself organized to be able to kind of drive a performance, but uh, Veronica can really swing it. And she's, she's really something to watch. Yeah, we all show everybody pictures of her swing, and they're like, well, that is show-stopping. I know that she was hitting balls, and World Golf Hall of Famer was at her the other day, and he was like, holy cow, that's what I want to swing like when I grow up. <laughs> um, so thanks for saying that. Uh, if you had to have anybody hit a putt for you, JP, one putt, 10 foot, who is it? One putt, 10 foot, Woods. Mark? Yeah, Tiger. Kevin? I, uh, you can't argue. I think Tiger's the guy, isn't he? Yeah, he's the guy. He's the guy for sure. If you had to have somebody pitch your golf ball out of any, all the diversified lives that they get on the PGA Tour, and one thing I wanted to say to everybody, we're seeing these best golf courses like primed up. Like I had seen Shadow Creek a bunch of times, but I hadn't seen it primed up like it was for this event this week. So we're seeing it with the rough so high or, or very low in different spots and very tricky and challenging. So they have to hit all the pitches. Who's going to hit that pitch shot for you, JP? Seve Ballesteros would hit the pitch shot. I mean, Seve, I just was getting into golf when he was at the peak of his powers, and, you know, he was something else. If you haven't seen, there was a YouTube video that they'd made in Dubai, and they never released it, and it's still got, the like, the old, uh, you know, when you used to have a video recorder, it has the date and the time on the top. And for however it's made it onto YouTube, and he talks a lot, you know, a lot about some of the the, the weapons that he uses around the green and things. And you know, for me, he was uh, he was always somebody that uh, could pitch it and chip it as well as anybody. Most quoted too, and what we just said, kind of like we said with Adam Scott. Everybody says, "Well, Seve used to do this." I hear that, I don't even know. I don't even know if he used to do that, but everybody says, "Well, this is the way that Seve did it." Yeah. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, same. And that same video I've got, I have yeah, it. Really cool. Everybody needs to get that too. Mark, um, JP, will you tell everybody what it is again so they can Google it? It's a YouTube video that was, uh, I, I think if you probably went in and went Seve by Stereo short game, and it was it was actually shot in Dubai way back, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think it was probably 1990, 1991. There were no buildings up around Emirates Golf Club and he was out on the second course there. Yeah. And an Asian tour player that I used to work with, Ross Bain was there that day and he watched him do it and he said it was just out of this world watching him do that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Kev, what you got? Still there, Kevin? Yeah, I think I think you know. Obviously, Seve was the guy that kind of really the first Kevin, person. You want to get a stroke play penalty, okay, for not saying your answer quick enough, okay? That's going <laughs> to your okay. score. All right, so we got I got a I got a, a group of guys that they may or may not. I think Seve was obviously kind of a, a you know the first person we thought about in terms of being able to pitch the ball. I like watching Patrick Reed pitch it. I like watching Shane Lowry pitch it. Uh, Emiliano Grillo is a beautiful pitcher of the golf ball. Correct. Uh, and Louis Wusthausen pitches the ball nicely. So those are the guys I, when I'm out there and uh, just that they're in in the pitching area, I usually stop and take a look and just and just enjoy watching them. Yeah, I might hand that ball to Jordan Spieth, too. He can pitch his rock, too. I, I do have to say this, JP. When I'm walking down the range, which is a lot, and we see each other a lot, besides stopping to get some water and hydrating a little bit and normally saying something sarcastic to you or Kevin or Mark, um, which we all giggle about one way or another, you say it to me, Louis stops me every time I walk past him. I have to watch him hit a shot or two. I have some video of him hitting just a little chip out of Augusta. And it's, you know, one of the things that I cherish. She has a beautiful motion. You're getting to watch that all the time on a daily basis. You don't even have to comment on this, but congratulations. It's got to be fun. And you've done great work with him. He, you know, he's he's a one. It's his birthday today, incidentally. Um, 38 years old. He's a he's a, a great gentleman, a great family man, somebody who is able to enjoy his life and his golf at the same time. And, um, you know, I would love to I would love to see him win in the United States. I know that. Uh, I know that he would love to win a Masters. I think that that, you know, I know he, he got uh, Bubba beat him in the playoff a few years back. And, you know, as Augusta rolls around twice in the next uh, six or eight months, whatever it's going to be, um, I, I know that he'll he'll be right up for trying to trying to get over the line there. But great to work for, fabulous player. And, you know, you stand there and you watch his golf swing and, you, you know, you wonder, you know, how something can, so beautiful can, can be in, in our game. We have a bunch of people on here that want to become better teachers and a lot much like we do. And I know where our quest is off to try to get better. Some people call us like we know all the answers and we don't. And I've learned so much from you all. And I learned so much from doing this so much. So we're all trying to get better. With that being said, and Kevin, I'll start with you. Why don't you give a minute to everybody on how they can get better at their craft? Well, I think the first thing is you got to teach a lot. I don't think you can get really good at anything like teaching without teaching a lot. I would say, uh, you know, follow your curiosity. Your curiosity. If you get curious about something, go seek it out. Uh, you know, we have access to some incredible. You can leverage your, yourself very, very quickly now with with the the internet and and uh, some of the networks that we have available. So, I mean, those would be two things that I would do. Just try to teach a lot, teach as much as you can, and uh, just follow your curiosity and, and don't uh, you know. Don't think you have to invent it all yourself. A lot of the things you're trying to figure out have already been figured out. Well stated, Mark. Yeah, I think the more time you can spend observing other people and asking questions and going and watching people is, is the best. There's no substitute for experience, and the more hands-on time you have teaching and assimilating hours, that will help you be better. Like it's, There's going to be a lot of ugly stuff that you don't like, but you have to work through it, but it, just watch other people and go teach people. The more time you spend teaching, the better you'll get. And you only learn through error and struggle. JP. I think I think curiosity is a great word. You know, Kevin was talking about curiosity. If you're curious about something, don't be afraid to experiment on yourself. Make sure that your understanding of something is personal before you try and deliver it to other people. Um, I would also say in the in the generation that we're at with this incredible like a myriad of information and you know available to everyone, make sure you have some sort of filter. Don't just take everything for granted. Um, and if there's something that you would like to understand better, as I say, and you're curious about it, m make it your own first. Make sure that you understand it and you know how it might work before you just throw it into you know your toolbox, so to speak. Yeah, I think that's well stated. Also, I also wanted to tell everybody in our section or anybody that's on the on the call, you're always welcome to reach out to us and send us an email if you have a question. If we know the answer, we'll give it to you. If we don't know the answer, we'll tell you we don't know, and we'll try to research it. But, but I think that's why, how you get better. And we're all in this in together. Uh, you know, we're doing this summit because we believe on making each of you better as we go along. And so uh, feel free to ask on that. All right, uh, this question, it's a two-part question, and uh, we'll close it up with this. 
if you had to take a golf lesson from anybody in the world, JP, who would it be? You personally. Me personally? Yeah. Um, with a view for me to get better at golf or with a view for me to learn and understand more about teaching golf? Um, you can do it both ways. So you can do it both ways. Good question uh, for the question. I would probably, I think I would probably like to go and see Dana Dahlquist and, and have him look at my stuff. I've, I've been interested in how he's evolved. I know he's out there on the on the West Coast. I haven't seen him on tour just as much. You know, I, I value, you know, the the way that he's able to, to, to have people moving the golf club well. And I think just from a, he, you know, he would be what I would refer to as a technician, and I don't think of myself so much as a as a technician. Um, so I would probably want to go and have a look and see if he could make me better at swinging the club. I'd probably go and see Gankus from a perspective of not really understanding everything that he's that he's doing necessarily, and wanting to know a little bit more. I want him to research and be a little bit more um au fait with you know with exactly you know some of the methods and some of the things that you know everyone's finding so interesting cool mark same question who's going to, who are you taking a lesson from past or present do i get to go to someone who's alive or do they have to be can i use dead people too no you, you, know, you can name a dead person if you want i do want you to get better though I mean, I've never, I've never actually spent a whole bunch of time with Butch, so I'd probably go get a golf lesson from Butch. I mean, we chatted and stuff, but I would be really interested to get a lesson from him or probably um, spend a lot of time with Pete but never got a golf lesson from. So those would be the two guys I'd be interested to go get a golf lesson from. Cool. Kevin? You know, scratching you three off the list at the top three, I think I'd have to kind of move down the list and uh, to four and five for me would be, uh, you know, I, I just got a ton of respect for, for Pete Cowan and, and Butch Harmon. I mean, the guys have, have, have had incredible success with world-class players. And, you know, part of that is, is their technical understanding and the other part of it is how to how to wind the guys up and, and, and get it out of them. So, uh you know, and that's the business that we're in. So those are the guys that that that, that, that inspire me, and and that I and I've been fortunate to be around both of them quite a bit. So, uh, uh, so if I if I had to to stop today to go uh, so have somebody watch me some golf balls, and you guys, you three guys weren't available, that's where I'd probably go. Thanks for that and, and good answer. Second part of the question. This is an interesting one here, right? If you had to send one of your players to somebody else to have them help them with their game, and you couldn't do it. For one reason or another, who would it be? Who we go with me again? Yeah, we're starting with you. Um, you know, I've I've met I've met so many great people both in Europe and in the United States. I mean, Drew Streckel, who did a great job, he's done a great job with with Jason Cockrack and a lot of other players. I mean, he you know he's somebody that you know that I would trust, and I you know I think that um, you. You know that's really a trust. That's going to be a trust thing that you want to. You want an opinion from somebody that you know you feel shares your values and things like that. So I'd probably throw Drew in there. Cool, Mark. What you got? I think it just it, that totally depends on the player. That's it's such a player personality. You for, take one guy, Mark. Mark's gonna be What's that? He said I can't give you one guy. Okay. Kevin, um, I think uh, you know. Other to 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 Mark's point a little bit. I think it, it has to be player dependent. But if I had to had to just pick one person, I'd probably send him to go see Pete. Oh. Pete, oh. Pete Cowan. Good answers. Jets, JP. It's really fun to watch you do your gig, and you're really good at what you do. And I think everybody could tell from today how inquisitive that you are and your take and how versed your take is, and it's worldly. And uh, it's a pleasure to be your friend, and thanks for joining us today. It's been really, really nice to listen to you, and I know that your players are gonna do great things in the future. Kevin, I wanna congratulate you on the 2019 uh, National PGA of the Year Award and your great career. You've done amazing, amazing things with your career, and I know there's a lot more to come. And uh, you're not only one of the best pros uh, that I've met, but also one of the most interesting people that I've met. And you're so humble and low key 
and uh, non-pretentious about the way that you go about it and you're always there. One of my favorite moments is after the President's Cup this year, after you caddied for Patrick Reed because his caddy couldn't caddy and he went off the last day and won his singles match, just spending time with you and seeing the gleam and glow in your eye because you guys had a good go and you won your point and, you know, or the American team won. Uh, that was a fun day. And uh, congratulations on your success, and I know there's more to come. And then, Mark, I know I've said this to you 40 times, but the National Teacher of the Year is so impressive. 29,000 PGA members. I'm super, super proud of you. I'm really proud to be your friend. I really uh, admire uh, your take on anything. I love when you call to ask me a question, and I always like to hear what you're going to say. And I always like to see the look on your face when I give you my answer, and I appreciate our relationship very, very much. And I know that you're going to do great things too as well. And on the question that I just asked for any of the coaches, you guys would be my answers on both patterns. I take a lesson from you, JP, or you, Mark, or you, Kevin, and I'd send any of my players to you guys well too. I think the world of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. And I'll look forward to, I know I'm going to see Kev, I'll see you up at Sherwood and JP and uh, Mark. I'll look forward to seeing you at Augusta. Thanks for sharing with, with my uh, fellow PGA uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, your great comments today. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, and just and, Thanks. and before we wind down, Jamie, I want to thank you for organizing, kind of, and pulling us all in for for the chat and for you know trying to kind of reach out and and share you know the your 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 knowledge and your your you know, your wisdom with with not only me and and the guys here on the panel, but also the other. Uh, people that have access to this today. So on behalf of all of us, thank you for, for all you do for us. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, cool. All right, see you later. Sign off, guys. Talk to you later. Thanks. Sounds good. That's Thanks. the next one. I'll let you guys work on the technical part, and I'm going to go to the... Hey, everybody. That was awesome. I want to thank uh, Jamie, Mark, Kevin, and Justin for uh, their insights, their experience, and their thoughts. Uh, it is definitely going to make all of us uh, better at what we do. I was a little surprised that uh, nobody would come to me for a lesson, but I will work on that. Uh, we're going to take a quick five-minute break, and then we'll be back here right at 11 o'clock get with uh, Jamie again, the psychology of playing the game of golf. So we'll see you folks here in five minutes.